All right, so we have a sense of pressure. We have a sense of the original gas laws. All of those gas laws essentially um, rely on keeping one of the, the variables or more constant, like Boyle's law, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, pressure and volume, but you have to keep the temperature from changing, otherwise that doesn't work. So if we combine all of these laws, all four variables, all four laws, uh, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, and Gay-Lussac's law into one, we put all of the variables together, but we maintain the mathematical relationships. So P is still multiplied by V, P is still divided by T, V is divided by T, V is divided by N, we get the combined gas law. Uh, kind of a weighty law there. There are eight variables in there. You have to know seven of them in order to use it, but you can. However, Probably the more useful gas law is something called the ideal gas law, which is represented by PV equals NRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, R is something called the universal gas law constant, and T is temperature in kelvins, of course. Uh, R is a proportionality con constant. If you take PV over NT, for a situation that we are aware of, like molar volume, for example. One mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure equals 22.4 liters. In that sentence, you will hear moles, temperature, pressure, and volume. And if I put all of those together in this relationship, PV over TN, I get this proportionality constant, 0 0.08206 if your pressure is measured in atmospheres and 8.314 if it's measured in KPA or um, if you want to work in joules. And so we'll see that the gas law constant is also going to be used when we're talking about energy, like kinetic energy. So what do we mean by ideal gas? What's an ideal gas and how is it different from a real gas? Well, an ideal gas is not real. It's, it's hypothetical. Um, it's a gas in theory um, and it always obeys the gas laws. So with real gases like oxygen or nitrogen or ammonia or any of those, uh, they best follow the gas laws when we're at low pressures and high temperatures. Because at low pressure or high temperature, the gas particles are spread out and get to move around a bit. When we approach uh, very high pressures or low temperatures, gases sometimes aren't gases anymore. Sometimes they liquefy or solidify. And uh, liquids and solids don't behave according to the gas laws anyway. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a, in a future video. Okay, so if uh, we're going to use PV equals NRT, then we can uh, make use of the moles in that and do some calculations. There are a couple of different things that we can do. First, we want to remember that one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure has a volume of 22.42 liters. Standard temperature and pressure means 0 degrees Celsius or 273 kelvins and one atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals or 760 torr. Pick your, pick your pressure. So at those conditions, one mole of any gas has the same volume, always 22.42. Now for real gases, here's some actual data. This is taken from your textbook. This is some actual data of gases molar volume. And you'll notice they're all right around 22.4. Um, you get down to the bottom with ammonia and you start getting some interactions between the molecules which actually pull them a little closer together uh, and then they take up a little less space. But in general we're talking right around 22.4 liters and, uh, and, and so even with real gases at zero degrees, that's a low temperature roughly, and uh, one atmosphere, okay, one atmosphere of pressure on a gas is reasonably uh, measurable, it's good and high, so we're behaving more or less like the ideal gas laws there. Uh, 22.4 liters is not a huge volume. Uh, it's about the size of a paper grocery bag or this box that this woman who I have no idea who she is, uh, but she's holding a box that is approximately 22.4 liters of volume. So that's just to give you perspective as to what we're talking about. One mole, one mole of gas. Really what that means is two grams of hydrogen at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. Two grams is one mole, about 2.02 .02 grams, uh, would, would occupy that volume. So it's very light, right? Gases are very light because their particles are so spread out. So molar mass can be incorporated into this. If we remember, molar mass, by the way, we represent that as capital M, uh, is grams per mole, grams over moles. Uh, grams is mass. We usually represent that with a lowercase m. And moles is almost always represented as n, 
in chemistry. So m over n is equal to capital M molar mass. And if we rearrange and solve for n, we get n is equal to mass over molar mass. Nothing new there. That's how you calculate the number of moles if you're given the mass and the molar mass of a substance. However, we can plug that m over m into our ideal gas law in place of moles. And so we get PV is, PV is equal to mass over molar mass times RT. Let's take it a step further. Density also involves mass, doesn't it? Density is mass over volume. So if we solve for mass, we get mass is equal to density times volume. Let's plug that in for mass in our new modified ideal gas law. We get PV equals dVRT over M. If we do a little algebra on this, divide both sides through and simplify, we can get pressure times molar mass is equal to dRT, or the molar mass of a gas can be calculated as the density times the ideal gas constant times temperature in kelvins divided by pressure. That's a nice little way of figuring out the molar mass of a gas and therefore maybe the identity of a gas just by giving some easily measurable data. You can measure the temperature, you can measure the density of a gas, and you can measure the pressure. And from that you can identify the gas's molar mass. Pretty cool. Let's do some examples. Here's an easy one. This is pretty simple. We have calcium oxide. We're going to make that by decomposing calcium carbonate according to this equation. We also get carbon dioxide at the end. Now we want to figure out how much carbon dioxide will be produced if I decompose 152 grams of calcium carbonate. Stop the video, write the problem down, give it a shot, come back. All ready? All right, so let's take a look and see if you got it. Pretty simple. We start with 152 grams of calcium carbonate. We convert that to moles using the molar mass. We then use the mole ratio from the balanced equation. Everything's one to one. It's nice. And then we use the molar volume because we are under standard temperature and pressure. It does say STP in our problem, so we can use 22.42 liters per mole. We should get 34.1 liters of CO2. Okay, pretty easy. That's basic gas stoichiometry. All right, let's take it to the next level. Here's a, a slightly more challenging problem. You're going to have to think a little bit about this, but I want you to try it without watching the explanation. See if you can figure it out and then come back for the explanation. So read the problem, write it down, write down the necessary information, and then see if you can solve it. Okay, are we ready? All right, so we have methane combusting, essentially. Uh, we have a, a volume and uh, pressure and temperature for the methane gas, and we have the volume temperature and pressure for the oxygen gas that we're going to react together. We combust them, we create carbon dioxide and water, we know about that already, and we want to find how much carbon dioxide, what volume, under specific conditions, 2.50 atmospheres and 125 degrees Celsius. So we've got a little bit of stuff we got to do. First thing we have to do is find the limiting reactant because we have information about both reactants. Whenever you're given information about both reactants, you need to know which one is limiting. So I need to know how many moles of each reactant I have. Well, to find the moles of methane, I'm going to use PV equals nRT. I'm going to solve for N. N is equal to PV over RT. Pressure I was given is 1.65. The volume is 2.80. R is R. And the temperature in kelvins is 298. It gives me 0.189 moles. I got to do the same thing for oxygen. So I solve the same problem, I get 1.75 moles of oxygen. So now the question is, which is the limiting reactant? Uh, given that the mole ratio is 1 to 2, you should be able to sort of figure it out. But if you need to prove it, this is how you do it. 1.189 moles of methane is 2 moles of oxygen required for every 1 mole of methane. That means we, have, we need 0.378 moles of O2. Well, we have 1.75 moles of O2. We have more than we need. That must mean that methane is the limiting reactant and O2 is in excess. Okay, So now that we know that methane is the limiting reactant, we begin with that. We're going to find the amount of product produced. Okay, Well, it's one mole of CO2 for every one mole of methane, so we produce 1.189 moles of CO2. Now we want to find the volume of that product. Now we need to use the other conditions that we're given. Okay, Volume is equal to moles times R times T over pressure. So moles we just solved for just above there. R is R, temperature in kelvins, and pressure on the bottom, and we get 2.47 liters of CO2. So how'd you do on that one? Did you get it? Here's another one. Try this one on your own. Shut off the video, give it a shot. 
When you are pretty confident that you have an answer, we'll take a look at it in class.